you are attending the Freedom of Choice Ohio 2020 Ohio Virtual Advocacy Day. Um, get logged on, get settled in, and we'll get started in just a moment. Welcome to NARAL's The Morning After. Each week, our podcast brings you the latest on reproductive health care, progressive politics, and the fight to keep abortion safe and legal. You can listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, YouTube, and on our website at ProChoiceOhio.org. The program also airs each Friday morning at 9 on WGRN 94.1 in Columbus, Ohio. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ProChoiceOH. NARAL's The Morning After is a production of NARAL ProChoice Ohio. Enjoy the show! Um, I want to welcome everybody uh, to, again, the Freedom of Choice Ohio virtual advocacy webinar. Um, my name is Sarah Inskeep, and I use she, her pronouns. I am the Ohio State Movement Building and Policy Director with Unite for Reproductive and, Gen uh, Reproductive and Gender Equity. Um, we are so thrilled to have all of you here today, um, virtual, um, online, uh, wherever you are across the state and community with us to talk about everything that's been going on, um, whether it be from uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic as we know it, um, the evolving landscape with legislation, um, and what's happening with reproductive health care and abortion access in the state. We'll go ahead and get started, and I would love to turn this over to our friends with the Ohio Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice to welcome us and ground us for today's webinar. Uh, so my name is Kelly Fox. I'm one of the faith organizers with Ohio RCRC, which Sarah said is the Ohio Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. I think that it's really important to have compassion for ourselves and um, to be able to give ourselves a break. And so um, I just want to lead us through this little meditation. Now, um, if everybody can get into a comfortable stance or position, I will start us off with this meditation. So I want to start by um, having us take a few deep breaths, kind of settle into your body and uh, be present in this moment. Now, try to locate your breathing wherever you feel it most easily. Feel your breath moving through your body. And when your attention wanders, feel the gentle movement of your breath again. If you notice that you're holding some difficult emotions, such as worry about the future or the unpredictability of this moment, Understand that every human body bears stress and worry throughout the day. You're not the only one going through this. Offer yourself goodwill because of the stress you're holding in your body right now. And as you offer yourself goodwill, I welcome you to repeat these words with me. May I be safe. May I be peaceful. May I be kind to myself. May I accept myself as I am. Return to your breathing and repeat, may I be safe, may I be peaceful, may I be kind to myself, may I accept myself as I am. And now just take a few last deep breaths, rest in your own body, and remember you can always come back these loving kindness phrases. Open your eyes. Thank you. Okay, um, so moving forward, um, I would like to welcome you all to this portion of the training. Um, we thought that it was really important to just give a quick lay of the land and legislative update, um, given everything that's happened recently. Um, what exactly is happening in Ohio? A lot, a lot has happened in Ohio over the course of the last few weeks. As it is uh, last week, the state legislature did return to the Capitol for um, in-person meeting on the 25th to pass House Bill 197, which was the state's first response to provide coronavirus relief. So House Bill 197 did expand unemployment benefits. It also extended absentee voting or vote by mail in Ohio until uh, April 28th. What's really, really important, we'll talk more about this um, in the next slide, is that um, obviously we are no longer having um, in-person voting for the primary election in Ohio. And so folks that have yet to vote 
have to vote by mail um, by requesting an absentee ballot form, receiving their form, mailing in their ballot and having it postmarked by the 27th in order to have your vote counted this election, which is critical. If you haven't requested your absentee ballot, be sure to do so as soon as possible. Um, if you do not have a printer, you can contact your Board of Elections by giving them a call um, or going online uh, to request your form at voteohio.gov. Again, make sure that you have your, your um, absentee ballot uh, postmarked for the 27th and that um, it's dropped off and or mailed uh, by the 28th. We of course have um, a lot of legislative updates as it relates to bills and bans that aim to restrict reproductive health care and abortion access specifically in the state legislature. Of the like 10 bills that are pending in the state legislature here, are a few that have moved recently and have been ones that we've organized and agitated around again in the past few weeks or months. Um, so naming uh, Senate Bill 260, which would ban the use of telemedicine for medication abortion. Uh, I think this, is, this legislation is even more, I mean, telemedicine is a wonderful piece of technology that folks should be using even in now during a pandemic. And we're seeing efforts in the state to expand uses of telemedicine to provide critical care. Um, that should be protected and expanded for medication abortion access as well. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing that that be threatened at the state level. Senate Bill 155, which is the like fake notion that folks can reverse their abortion, um, which we know to not be based in sound, evidence-based, comprehensive <laughs> facts and medical care, and has um, also moved through the state legislature in addition to Senate Bill 28. Uh, we also had two House bills that were recently introduced, House Bill 538, um, which is also referred to as like a trigger ban. Other states have also seen this bill introduced. And if, you know, this bill were to pass, it would immediately block access um, at the state level uh, if the Supreme Court were to overturn Roe versus Wade. So that is a really immense threat and one of the most like extreme legislative pieces that pose threat given any action that happens at the federal level with the Supreme Court. In addition to that, we have House Bill 413 and House Bill 297. These are all the bad bans, the restrictions, and bans to abortion care that are currently pending in the state legislature. Um, we want you all to be contacting your legislator about um, and encouraging them to stop all of these. All bans and all restrictions to abortion care are harmful and dangerous, and all of which have been unfortunately uh, pushed at the state level and really rooted in misinformation, stigma, and shame for people that need to access that care. However, However, um, I feel like that is just such a large update about all the bad um, that's currently in the <laughs> state house. Um, it's not all doom and gloom in Ohio. We do have some proactive legislation that is critical for us to uplift and encourage our legislative allies in the state house to do what they can to get hearings for these bills, to ensure that these bills move forward as well, um, and that our legislative allies uh, do everything that they can to introduce and pass more proactive legislation that's reflective of our values and will protect uh, folks' access to care and abortion access. There's House Bill 407, which would require medical providers and clinicians to provide evidence-based and medically accurate health care information to patients. It's kind of crazy to think that uh, that's a bill that we have to introduce at the state level, but as a result of the package of bills that we've seen on the oppo opposition side that deny science, that deny evidence, that de deny um, health, best health care practices, um, this is a bill that we're seeing be introduced and should be should be passed. You know, it's not uh, too much to ask for medical providers to give you factual information, right? Um, especially when it comes to your health care. That's critical, even, even more now um, in light of COVID-19. Another bill uh, that we have is House Bill 435, which is the Save Your Mothers Act. This is Rep. Crawley's bill that would establish continuing education requirements for birthing facility personnel and improve birth equity outcomes to help narrow the disparities both for race and ethnicity and to address implicit bias in our health care system. Um, so it, it, it may go without saying that um, the abortion bans and restrictions that we have place um, disproportionately like unfortunate outcomes for uh, people of color, young people, uh, for folks that are of low income uh, and have um, tremendous long-lasting consequences for their health care. And so this is a, a tremendous piece of legislation that could continue that education and require our folks that are working in health care to do that, that education so that when they're providing care on the front lines that 
they are doing so with up-to-date information and, and information that is um, informed with um, implicit bias training. And then the last bill, uh, last bill that I will briefly go over before passing it off to Erin Ryan is House Bill 91. Um, she'll go into more depth about paid leave and sick leave, but um, another bill that uh, Janine Boyd introduced is the Family and Medical Leave Insurance Act, which would provide um, economic stability for families in times of a medical emergency or for folks that are caring for loved ones or um, starting a family. So that is a long-winded update as far as legislation. Um, we have good and bad, um, but what is important that you have this information, that you know the bill numbers, that you know the top lines of what these bills do, um, and we'll be providing you more information as to um, what actions you can take to help stop and of course, promote and uplift the positive proactive legislation that um, we so much need in the state. And so with that, I will pass it over to Erin Ryan to talk more about paid leave. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Unfortunately, in the United States, there's no national standard for permanent programs of either of these policies. That means that access essentially comes down to where you work or where you live. And that leaves behind millions of working people, particularly women, people of color, and low-wage workers who are least likely to have access. Now, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has really helped to expose those cracks in our caregiving system, and it's also drawn attention to the inequities in access to benefits. But it's important for us to remember that the need for these policies did not start with, and it does not end with COVID. People need emergency and permanent paid leave during this crisis and beyond. And while Congress has overwhelmingly ignored those needs for paid leave in the past, they did take action in one of the, the recent COVID economic relief packages to extend emergency paid sick days and paid leave to temporarily fill those gaps. So in the second um, relief package that um, Congress passed, they did include a paid sick provision that provides up to 10 days of paid sick leave for a worker that covers three specific reasons. The first one is personal paid sick. So if a person themselves is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order, if they've been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine, or if they're experiencing COVID symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis, they are covered by this leave. The second reason is caregiving leave. So if a person is taking care of another individual, and it's a pretty broad definition of um, beyond just family members, you're also covered in that caregiving leave. And then the third reason that falls under this paid sick days bill is if a person needs leave from work and cannot telework um, to care for a child or children whose school or place of care is closed or unavailable because of COVID. And then the, the second big component is um, around extended paid family leave. And Sarah kind of touched on this a little bit of the, the more um, extended paid family leave provisions um, that have been introduced here in Ohio. But Congress in this recent COVID bill severely watered down what this actual paid leave provision um, provides access to. So in the final version of this bill, um, it provides 12 weeks of paid leave only if an individual needs extended leave to care for their child or children whose school or child care has closed or if their child care is no longer available. So Congress completely cut out any of that long-term personal medical leave or caregiving leave and that leaves behind a lot of folks who maybe are experiencing more severe COVID cases who need more than just that two weeks of provided paid sick days. So another important component of this legislation is, is who is and who is not actually eligible for benefits. The Federal Families First Act, which is that relief bill that included these benefits, did extend new paid sick days and paid leave policies to many people, but millions of working people were explicitly cut out and left behind, or they're at risk of being cut out of coverage with possible employer exemptions. So in order to access these benefits, you need to work for a private sector company that has fewer than 500 employees. So that's cutting out a lot of folks who work for these big businesses that have more than 500 employees. And that was explicitly done by members of Congress to exclude these large businesses. Um, you can also work for a public sector company regardless of size. And the bill doesn't exclude different classifications of workers. So um, many folks who are often ineligible or don't meet certain requirements in 
getting um, typical benefits like this are able to access them as long as they meet the other requirements. And that includes part-time workers and hourly workers, uh, domestic workers, and gig or contract economy workers, which is huge. But again, there were some possible gaps where folks were not explicitly cut out, but they were provided, their employers were provided exemptions um, to certain benefits. And that includes workers at small businesses with fewer than 50 employees, healthcare workers and first responders, and certain federal government employees. So as you can see from this very quick summary of what is in those bills, there are some real limitations in this final legislation about who is covered and the purposes of leave taking. Um, we're going to continue advocating to Congress um, with our state and national partners to help fill these gaps in, in the next relief package that we expect in April. And we're also going to be um, pushing Congress to address really one of the most significant downfalls of this bill. And that's the fact that these are not permanent programs. These are only related to COVID and they sunset at the end of this year. So right now we know these needs are amplified during a public health crisis, but um, as, as folks know and are experiencing themselves, um, people need access to these paid leave policies every single day to address long and short-term health needs while protecting their jobs and their paychecks. Access to paid leave is a matter of reproductive justice. These policies are really core to making sure that we're promoting stronger health outcomes and economic opportunity for working people and their families. So for example, we know one in four moms returns to work within 10 days of giving birth, and that's often because of economic necessity. Access to gender-neutral paid parental leave policies can really help promote those stronger health outcomes for birthing parents and infants by protecting income and job security. And that helps give folks time to recover, to heal, to get used to a new routine, and to take care of a new infant that is that they're welcoming into their family. When it comes to paid sick and safe days, we know that these policies can help support a person's ability to access abortion care or to seek legal and social services to leave an abusive relationship without risking that loss of income during that time. These comprehensive and inclusive policies that actually work to center the most marginalized folks can address disparities and access. They can address a lot of these health and economic disparities that we see with who needs these policies the most but is left out of them, and that's women, people of color, and low-income working people. So ultimately, paid leave helps support people's ability to become a parent, to care for children, and to parent with dignity by helping people financially, emotionally, and physically provide for and support themselves, their children, and their families. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, that was a really comprehensive overview. Um, and so with that, I would like to introduce Lauren Blavel Copeland with Planned Parenthood Advocates of Ohio to provide us a um, greatly anticipated clinic and abortion access update. Again, I'm Lauren Blavel Copeland with Planned Parenthood Advocates of Ohio. We are used to a fight, y'all, and this situation has been no different. Abortion is essential health care. All of our abortion providers are working together to ensure that they are meeting and complying with the Ohio Department of Health orders. And our patients, our staff, and our community's health Health and safety is our number one priority, as always. And abortion is essential health care. It is a time-sensitive service, and it is our commitment to keep providing abortion health care through this COVID-19 public health crisis. We know that the anti-choice movement is a horrible movement, constantly trying to come after our health and our rights. And in this moment, it is no different. It is a political issue for them, and they are absolutely trying to capitalize on a global pandemic. We cannot back down, and we are not backing down. We are continuing to work together to ensure that our health care continues to be accessible. And we appreciate all of your support continuing to lift up the important message that abortion health care is essential. Ohio's abortion clinics are still open and that abortion is legal in Ohio. The Ohio Attorney General, Dave Yost, is unfortunately continuing to fall to the political attacks uh, that the anti-choice movement is, is pushing right now and he is trying to work to close down Ohio abortion clinics. This is why the ACLU, Preterm, Planned Parenthood, Women's Med, and Northeast Ohio Women's Center, along with our incredible Ohio local attorneys, have sued the state of Ohio and on Monday received a temporary protection order continuing to protect access to abortion care here in Ohio. We know this fight is going to continue. We know the antis are not giving up. Unfortunately, Attorney General Yost is continuing to say that he is not giving up. What is important is that we are not giving up. We are working as closely together as ever, as coordinated as ever, and are doing everything we can to continue to provide this essential health care. And we know that the political fight is not the only problem that we are experiencing as abortion providing 
providers here in Ohio. Um, we have to continue to um, have enough staff and enough resources and materials con to continue providing care. As we continue to work together, you know, our, our commitment is strong, but we know that this moment is, is going to be difficult. It is difficult and it's going to remain that way. So I want to quickly uh, bring in our amazing abortion fund, uh, Stephanie Paddock Sherwood, uh, the executive director of Women Have Options, is going to continue to talk about the contingency planning. Thanks so much, Lauren. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Steph Craddock Sherwood, uh, and I'm the executive director of Women Have Options, uh, Ohio's statewide independent abortion fund. Um, abortion funding is, is a form of mutual aid. So our mission has always been to respond to public health emergencies. Scope is a little bit different now, and so are the barriers to access. These circumstances make it clear uh, for everyone the value of the idea we've always fought for, that taking care of our community's access to healthcare is everyone's responsibility. Um, we have in general seen a bike in callers to our hotline, as well as financial need. I mean, we're seeing essentially, you know, as insecurity around jobs, food, paychecks, uh, childcare, as we see those things happening, we're seeing a lot more need as far as like uh, barrier, like overcoming the barriers to abortion access. Uh, clinics are still open, and we're trying to remind folks that the number of panicked calls that we've gotten, the number of panicked messages we've gotten about uh, folks worried that their appointment has been canceled um, is actually pretty shocking, even to us. So keep on spreading the word that abortion is still legal in the state of Ohio and it's still accessible. We are, though, definitely uh, planning for a potential almost worse than post-row kind of situation. Clinics have to close either because they're forced to, like what's happened in Texas, keeps on going back and forth, um, or if it's a situation where clinics have to close because clinic staff is not immune both to the you know, collective trauma as well as the COVID virus itself. Uh, we need to make sure that we plan so that people don't fall through the cracks. Uh, a couple of things that we're doing is we are um, uh, are working with clinics out of state and we're working with our other partner funds to uh, make sure that we can get people out of state, which is also a kind of a shocking thing to have to do, especially during a pandemic. Travel is, is dangerous and we don't want to encourage travel, but closing clinics, they could encourage travel. People are going to also delay care, making abortion a lot more expensive, especially later in pregnancy, it can go up $100 a week. We have been doing a lot more planning and increasing funding support, as well as transportation support, uh, gas cards, all that kind of stuff. DeWine keeps on talking about the baby boom that's going to happen. I just cringe every time he talks about that because, you know, pregnancy is not always, you know, a happy, joyful thing. And so we're uh, expanding our support for um, emergency contraceptive access. So you can go and contact us if you're interested in getting some emergency contraception for yourself or for your community. Thank you, Steph, and thank you, Lauren, for that, uh, that critical update, and thank you for your work. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Kelly Freeman with uh, NARAL Pro-Choice Ohio to share a little bit about um, how you all can contact contact your legislators, hold them accountable, um, and you know be annoying online for the sake of protecting abortion access and reproductive health care in the state. So, well, hello. Yes, my name is Kelly Freeman. I'm the state field manager with NARAL Pro-Choice Ohio. First and foremost, we do have a pet petition for folks to sign. Um, it's at the abortionislegalinohio.com website. It's a petition that goes to Attorney General Dave Yost, telling him he's got to stop politi politicizing the health and well-being of Ohioans and let Ohio abortion providers continue to provide essential health care services during COVID-19. You could also bother him on Twitter, email, and phone. So yeah, let's talk about lobbying. Lobbying is an arsenal in your tool belt uh, for agitating for change. It's to seek to influence a, a public official or politician or decision maker on an issue. It's, adv it's advocacy, it's advertising, it's promoting a particular cause. So anytime you're just like, hey, stop that, that's lobbying. You got, you're ahead of the curve, good job. So here's a couple of different ways that you can lobby. Um, we at NARAL Pro Choice Ohio have uh, our Twitter testimony that we first did during the six week ban, our senior organizer 
organizer, Hannah Servideo, put together a really great blog post on uh, the Narrow Pro Choice Ohio blog. You want to keep your video to two minutes or less. You want to clearly state your case and use your own words. There are some talking points in the, the link for the petition for COVID-19. So if you need some help kind of coming up with your case, we are here to help you. If possible, we want you to include a personal story or experience. How has previous legislation affected you or your family? How could this proposed closing of clinics affect you or your family? This is the only time I will say be nice. <laughs> Most of our lawmakers in the Ohio legislature have voted for abortion bans in the past. Many have not. Um, so we want to appeal to all of them. Don't share any information that you would not be comfortable sharing publicly because Twitter is public. We will like retweet these videos if you at Pro Choice Ohio or any of our other partners. This is just you engaging with your public official. You voted or didn't vote for them um, and they are elected to represent you. Tag your legislators. You can tag them sometimes even if you're not friends with them on Facebook. You can even find your legislators sometime on Instagram. Most of our Democratic legislators are on Instagram, so you can follow them and get in their DMs, which I also recommend. As far as digital engagement, plenty of legislators are having virtual and teletown halls. Um, so I recommend following your legislators' uh, pages on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, and convince your friends to join you because the more numbers you have, the better. Basically, repetition is key, and if you go to all of the different social medias they have, the more times they hear the same message, even if it's from one person, that's a lot of the me same message uh, repeating over and over and over again. And if you want to find your legislators' information, uh, you can go to legislator.ohio.gov, which has all the bills for this General Assembly that you can find out who's been sponsors, co-sponsors, uh, votes, all of the, like, the contact info for House and Senate. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, Rhiannon Childs with the Ohio Women's Alliance. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Rhiannon Childs, Ohio Women's Alliance. Uh, Ohio Census Advocacy Coalition is a group of organizations coming together to ensure Ohioans complete the census and to make sure that they are accounted to increase resources in our communities. Um, Ohio Women's Alliance is a part of this coalition in reaching hard-to-count populations in Ohio. What is the census? And I'm going to give you like a brief, really brief historical context of why it's important. Um, the census is a nationwide count of everyone who lives in the United States, but it's to make sure the government represents all the people in our country. And the U.S. Constitution requires a head count for everyone every 10 years. So responding helps shape resources for our children and our community over the next decade. And folks have the opportunity to complete the census from um, March through August 2020. So the census provides very critical data for for lawmakers, business owners, teachers, and you know many others um, rely on this data to provide daily services, products, um, and support for our communities. And every year, billions of dollars in federal funding go to our hospitals, fire departments, schools, roads, and other resources are based off this data. And the results of the census are determined by the number of seats in our United States House of Representatives. It um, is definitely used to help draw fair districts obviously very important for each and every one of us. Some folks have already taken a census. Some of you may have already because you should have received an invitation by mail. If you have not participated in the census by May, a field staffer will come to your house to make sure that you're accounted. As I mentioned earlier, you have until August the 14th and you can take it by phone or by mail. You can uh, go to my2020census.gov. $33 billion comes into Ohio from the federal government to support critical programs such as Medicaid, SNAP, um, and that's for people who um, need access to like food stamps and food um, for their family, highway construction, low-income housing, transit grants, small business loans. So there's um, a lot that is determined by the census. And Ohio will lose over $1,200 per person who does not complete uh, the census. People of color are hurting the most and underserved uh, resources now is more important than ever with the pandemic to make sure that we are reaching, you know, every community. All right. So, um, Immigrants uh, obviously are one of the hard to count populations and Ohio, um, we have over half a million and 107 of a thousand of those are undocumented. So it's now more important than ever that we are going out into our communities and reaching those who um, need the support now more than ever. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Rhiannon. Um, I appreciate it. And I want to turn this over to Katie Shanahan with All on the Line to talk about um, redistricting and uh, the role of fair maps in all of this. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining today. We are a grassroots advocacy campaign that is part of a national effort to end gerrymandering. Um, our mission is twofold. One, to not only increase awareness about the harmful impacts that gerrymandering has on the communities where we live and on the issues that we care about, like reproductive health issues and access to abortions, for example. Example. Fun fact, Ohioans overwhelmingly support both of those things, although you certainly wouldn't be able to tell that from the nearly onslaught of attacks on both of those things from our legislature. And the reason for that is because of how gerrymandered our maps are. Um, so not only raising awareness about that specifically, but also raising people's participation in the actual redistricting process itself when it happens. It won't happen until 2021. So maybe you're wondering why I'm on here today to talk about redistricting. Um, the reason I'm here is because there's actually a lot that we can do this year to help set us up for success to get fairer districts next year. Next slide. And one of those things is the census. Um, so the census and redistricting and gerrymandering all fit together. I want to talk about that very quickly. Um, so we see the 2020 census and getting a complete and accurate count on the census as actually the first crucial step to getting fair maps in 2021. We can't have one without the other. So just as a reminder, obviously, the census happens every decade. It's our once in a decade opportunity to help shape the future of our communities. And at the center of the census are two things. One, it's about getting financial power. So it's about making sure that our communities get the resources that they need in the billions of dollars in federal aid that Rhiannon just talked about that comes through for a variety of different programs and services to make sure that we all lead healthy and stable lives, especially as we're all facing a global pandemic, right? It's also though about political power. So the data that's used from the census gets used for two major reasons. The first is um, it helps apportion or allocate how many U.S. House of Representative members each state gets. So there's always 435 U.S. House reps. They have to get divided between the 50 states and D.C. And that gets done after we do the census. So we um, share them all out based on the proportion of population that we all have. Um, so here in Ohio, we're actually going to go down from 16 U.S. House reps to just 15, not actually because we're losing population. We're just not gaining it quite as quickly as other states are. Um, but then that underlying census data that captures how population and demographics have shifted in our neighborhoods and across our state for the last decade. Um, that then underscores the necessity for every state to go under the redistricting process, which is just the process of how we redraw lines to actually um, help compensate for where those population shifts have occurred across the decade. Um, and the reason we do that is because of this idea of one person, one vote. So this is a principle that is guaranteed to all of us in the U.S. Constitution. The idea here is that no one person's vote should hold any more power or be weighted any more heavily than anybody else's. My vote, right, doesn't count any more than any of your votes count. But the way that we do that is by making sure that all of our districts, whether it's your state legislative districts or your congressional districts, are about equally populated so that we are all proportionally represented in those legislative bodies. Now, obviously, the next part that comes in there is the gerrymandering piece, right? So redistricting is just the act of redrawing those lines. So if you remember anything about this presentation today, I hope you remember these three takeaways. The first is that every 10 years, the federal government has to conduct the census. That's something that's required in the Constitution. And believe it or not, there are still people in the federal government who believe in following the Constitution. So that's part one, right? Part two is that after the census is done, every state has to go through the redistricting process. Every state has to redraw lines for your congressional and state legislative districts and then also down to your local district. So maybe you live in a city that has awarded city council. Those also have to get redrawn um, to account for any changes in population over the last decade. Um, the third piece, though, is that gerrymandering is not required. So what's the difference between gerrymandering and redistricting? Gerrymandering is a form of cheating. It's when politicians use 
use the redistricting process to manipulate where they're drawing district lines to, at the expense of fairness, give their political party some amount of power over the other by cheating people out of having an adequate voice in our political process. You see that in Ohio, both on our congressional maps and also on our state legislative maps. You see a complete um, difference in how Ohioans actually vote. Spoiler, we are not a red state. We are very much a purple state who votes almost 50-50 down the middle. <laughs> Love that fist bumping, Kelly. Um, we are a purple state. We vote um, Republicans just slightly edging out Democrats, getting 52% of the vote, and yet they capture a super majority of the seats. So even though they're only winning 52% of the vote, they get three quarters of our congressional delegation, and they get super majorities in both of our state legislative chambers. And that's not fair. And the reason for that is gerrymandering. So your first task of the day is to fill out your census. If you have not already, you can do it online by going to my2020census.gov. You can do it over the phone, or you can fill out the form itself. Whichever way you do it, make sure that whoever is in your house as of today, as of April 1st, 2020, from your little kids to your grandparents, count every single person, and then get out and vote if you have not already in Ohio's primary. No, lots of confusion about the change of the date. Um, request an absentee ballot if you haven't already. Make sure that you're sending it back to your Board of Election with a postmark of April 27th so that your voice is heard. Make sure that you're voting for folks who are fair map advocates. So we're going to be voting for state legislators and state Supreme Court justices. who are going to be either drawing the maps or judging the maps, right? Um, and then come help us next year and make sure that we get fair maps. I'm also going to drop um, a Twitter link in the chat box right now. Um, I didn't get a chance to add this to the slide deck, but we're doing a hashtag census challenge today. I hope you will join us. Basically, all you do is you take a selfie or a video explaining why the census is important to you. You tag three of your friends and you tag get counted. Make sure you tag all on the line, my organization, so we can boost you up and spread the information about why the census is so important, right? It's not just about changing um, what happens over the next four years. It's about changing what happens over the next 10 years. It's about making making sure that all of our voices are heard and that we actually get a shot at getting fair districts and the fair political representation that we all deserve for the next decade. So thank you so much for being on the call today. I hope you are all staying as well as can be and healthy. And thank you to Sarah for the invite to talk today. Thanks, Katie. I appreciate um, all of your knowledge and expertise on this topic. You're honestly the best person to present on this. <laughs> thank you for joining us, both you and Rhiannon. Um, thank you to all of our partners. Thank you for everybody who joined. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and we'll be in touch soon. Take care.